For a Christian man or woman, we have a task to be like a runner who is carrying a baton, which is the faith in Jesus Christ. It is also important to pass the baton of faith to our children. No inheritance is more valuable than this. Our goal is to ensure that the baton of faith will be passed on from generation to generation, that God's plan of salvation for the whole world is achieved. Good morning, church. It's odd to have your husband uh, introduce you professionally. <laughs> Okay, um, let me start with, with a story. We talk about a man who on one dark night was returning home back from his village into, towards his home. And this is, remind, and let me tell you, this is somewhere in the 1940s, so you don't have electricity on the roads or in, in, the, in the parts there. So he has this torch and he's lighting it and he, he's making his way home. And in the midst of his walking, the torch light fails. But because it's a, a route that he takes in daily, he's able to find his way home. And just a few meters before he reaches the home, the torch light switches on. Okay, so you may say, there's nothing exciting about this story, but let me go on to tell you that uh, later, this man got to understand that there was someone waiting in ambush to hurt and kill this man. And it gets even more interesting to tell you that this man that I'm talking about is my grandfather. Now, this is one among the many stories that my father narrates to his children, to his grandchildren, about God's faithfulness, about God's goodness, in, in their generation. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, um, I had been, I had attended a family conference. It was a visionary family conference where they cast a vision for families. And when I heard that, I was really excited. And, uh, you know, what they wanted us to do was go back to your church and, and cast that vision back into your church. And week after week, you and I hear you know, the vision of APC. So what's the vision of APC? To be salt and light, to Bangalore and a voice to the nation and to the nations. So when I heard that, I said, oh God, that's such, you know, it's, it's so wonderful because we are, as a church, we're looking to become a great commission church, aren't we? Right? And we were discussing certain foundational steps in how we could we could do that there. And I'm really excited to come in and share this opportunity with you uh, just to share the vision with you, and I'm just praying that God would help us take that vision and take it on. So let's just start with a word of prayer. Father God, I thank you for every opportunity that you open out to us. We know, God, that, that when we're here to do something, it's, it's never a mistake. Father, we ask, I ask specifically, Lord, that even as we cast this vision, Lord, that you will keep our hearts and our minds open to knowing what you want of us as a church, as families, as individuals. And Lord, as I stand here, I pray, Lord, that you would use me and you would, you would have your spirit in me, Lord, to be able to deliver what you want. In Jesus' precious name, I pray. Amen. I'm a bit more nervous today because I have uh, my children sitting here. Now, it's not easy preaching about family when your children are sitting here. Okay, because I know I'm going to get a scorecard when I reach home. Anyway, right, so how many of you in the house are athletes? Come on. Just three? Four? Okay, all right. I, th I thought, yeah, okay, I can see someone at the back. All right. So if you're interested in sport, one of the favorite track events is relay. Yes? So what happens in a relay? There's a lot of excitement there because usually the relay is one. Uh, in the transfer of the baton, right? The relay is one in the transfer of the baton. The, the, the runner, I mean, ne hardly ever drops the ba baton on the way, on the track. But it is when it is being transferred to the next runner, if you have thimble fingers, you are, you know, you drop it. And what happens? You know, you, your whole house boos you. Don't they? Yeah, your whole house boos you because you haven't done your job very well. So today, 
There is a parallel metaphor that I want to draw, is to pass on the gospel of Jesus Christ to our future generations. How do we pass on the baton? Family generations in God's big picture. So for, me, for you and me as a Christian man and woman, the primary task is to be a runner. We are all runners. And it is our responsibility to be able to transfer the baton for us who are parents to our children. And for those of us who aren't married and who are single, maybe it is to someone you mentor in church, maybe it's someone you have in your life group, it is our responsibility to pass on this baton. So, I, so we see that there is nothing more important than being able to pass this inheritance on. You know, as parents and as families, don't we pass on our inheritance to our children? And so much more greater is passing on the baton of faith to our generation. All right, so why is it important that we should pass on this baton? Why is it necessary that we should have this vision, this multi-generational vision? You know, in a study that I read, um, the crisis is that a close to 60 to 65% of children who attend Christian home, who are in Christian homes and attend Christian schools or are in a Christian church, when they get older, walk away from the faith. So what I'm saying is almost 65 of our young people, when they are older, leave the faith at a point of time. So we as parents, so even as I have this message, I, I would like the young people who are not married to still be awake because you can get nuggets of truth through this, okay? Yes, young people? I get your yes for it? Yes, thank you. Okay. So we as parents or we as people, we are faced with uh, this, the, the philosophy of scientism, okay? And that's what we're all bombarded with. Let me tell you, I know that's a big word, but not that hard. It's just the belief or the worldview that does not, the, uh, uh, sorry, it's a belief or the worldview um, of natural science being the only reliable source of knowledge. That natural science is the only source Reliable source. So let me give you an example. So for example, evolution. Evolution is taught to our children in school as a fact, whereas it's still a theory. And anyone who opposes that is meant to be ridiculed. Okay, so we are in that world. And no wonder that our children find it so hard to live out that biblical worldview. Do you agree? Because everywhere... That's what they hear. They hear about science and that is what takes them to. That's what is real. That's what is in the real world. And that's how, that's what occurs. That's where it occurs. Our generational crisis occurs there because we lose more of our children and our grandchildren than we have adult converts into the faith. So when you look at the proportion, we're losing more than we're gaining more. Isn't that sad? Yes? I mean, I thought that was really heartbreaking to understand that we are not even, our cards are not even matching. Our, our balance sheet is not even matching. We are still at a losing point. So you would tell me, okay, this is not the problem. The problem lies in the church. But let me tell you, I think in the last many years, in the last 50 years, we have many more programs in church to cater to the young, to cater to the youth. So you have youth ministry, you have Sunday school ministry, you have youth clubs, I mean, there's, there's life groups for young people. So I wouldn't believe it's the dearth of that. In fact, there is enough and more of it. It's not the crisis of the church. It is the crisis of a family. So if you look a century ago, let's say 100 years ago, it was the responsibility of daddy, mommy, appacha, amachi, sorry, I'm a Malayali, so you'll hear those words, aunt, uncle, to pass on the faith to the children. It was the, that, that's, what, that's how that progression took place. So it was home-centered and it was only church-supported. Now what happens? We've, it's twisted. We have become church-centered and home-supported. We, families look for, to have their children in the faith more at church rather than at home. So... That is in a really sorry state. We are in a sorry state because the advancement of the gospel is only, it starts 
in a where in the home the advancement of the gospel starts in a home so as believers what do we do you know we make attempts we have such a passion to reach out the world so we are all reaching out the world maybe through our offices through our friends but what we have missed out is we've missed out our homes and thereby there is such a gap there is such a lacune that is there okay so in short our spiritual life should be dedicated to our spiritual responsi- responsibility who is my spiritual responsibility my children my family is my spiritual responsibility my spiritual opportunity is the world outside my spiritual opportunity is the church but then my spiritual life should first target my spiritual responsibility because if i get that straight you know there is so much more that is there god has such a huge plan for those of us who ensure that that we carry on that spiritual responsibilities at in our home so in this message i really want to explore the vision god casts for us to pass on this baton which is most eff- eff- effective in our families okay so before we get that let me just talk to you about two purposes of the families i know we've said this over and over again but i think just to build a foundation it will be really important for me to set that why did god create a family so the first purpose god created families to be discipleship centers so when you look at matthew chapter 28 verse 19 the command of discipleship is to what does god want us to do is to church wake up is to make disciples so that's the command that's been given to each one of us so there is a lot of talk that we in church do about discipleship right so we have these you know these certain buzz lines we say we need to do life together you know let's meet together let's live to let's live uh, and understand let's be authentic right so god has found created a solution for that god has created a solution in finding out where we can have disciple centers yes the church looks at it as life group but you know god has another name for it what is it it's a family a family is a miniature life group that is where you are the most authentic you are the most you not in your church life group we have a mask we put on a lot of faces there right but at home is where we have our first life groups and that's the place to make disciples so discipleship happens in the context of relationships discipleship happens in the context of relationships so it's the family is the most powerful group where life change happens ultimately as a family we are all spiritual we need to be spiritual and that's what we need to cultivate the next purpose is god designed the family as an essential engine of world evangelization that he achieves through multi generations i know that's a lot of big words i'll split it out for you so what he's saying is i want to fill this earth with my people and how does he do that how yeah daddies and mummies you get married you get children and they get children they get children and that's how it fills the earth right normal biology yes so god wants us to fill the earth with what with his people with his glory with his word with his worship and that's what god purposes for a family so when you if you think of family as okay just me my husband my kids we eat we sleep we work i get my kids married then i die then they will do the same well that's not how god looks at it he has a much greater vision for each one of us because he wants us through our families to fill the earth with his knowledge with his word and that's the greatest purpose so let's keep these two purposes in mind even as we go forward so what i want to do today is connect two things i'm going to connect your family so look at your family and look at god's plan for the world so what's god's plan for the world salvation he wants every one of us to be saved so god's looking at your family and salvation and he connects this throughout the bible and you'll be amazed to see how he connects that you know i didn't even think that could happen but he connects every family with his bigger plan 
there is an amalgamation of these two. And, and I'd like to take you through some of this. So even as I go through it point by point, I'm going to take you through a lot of scripture today, just so that we have an understanding of what we're saying. So the first one, God reveals his plan to the first family. Who, is, who was the first family? Adam and Eve. So you know what's the first thing God tells them? If you look in Genesis 1, 28, he says, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, and subdue it. So what is God doing? He's saying, hey, Adam and Eve, this is my plan. I want you to do what? Fill the earth, make children, make babies, and let them have. So fill the earth. So that's the first family that God gives this, this command to. He reveals that plan. Later on, if you look in Genesis chapter 9, verse 1, he does the same to who? Noah. So in between Adam and Noah's time, there was a lot of wickedness. So what did God do? He destroyed the earth with all the wickedness out of it. So he cast back that vision to Noah. And what was the vision he cast again in Genesis chapter 9 verse 1? What is it? Be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth. So that's what he told the first two families. Right? And does that apply for us today? Be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, subdue it? Yes, it does. Okay. So how can we take this plan that God gave the first family as an application? I just believe for us just being a family, that is husband, wife, children, if we are united, if we are cohesive, if we are functional, we can be very strong testaments to the world. Would you agree? In a world, in a, in a place like ours where marriage is seen um, so lightly, there are broken families, just being together as a family is a testament. It's a testimony. Do you know that all of you all are living testimonies? Do you know that? Can I hear a... Yes! And the flip side of it is, when it's a broken home, it not only brings individual hurt. Who does it hurt further? It hurts the heart of God when there are broken families. So to get the vision, the first thing that we need to understand is, as a family, Okay, I am asked to fill the earth. Let's look at point two. God's plan is to reach the nations through the family. God's plan is to reach the nation through the families. Let me read you scripture. So this is in Genesis 18, where God articulates his promise to Abraham. Let's read that. Since Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. So what does God do? He chooses Abraham and says, hey, Abraham. I'm going to give you a global ministry. Does he say that? He's going to give him a nation, right? So can you imagine 4,000 4, years ago, a global ministry is not easy. A global ministry is easy today. How? Because we have the internet, we have social media, we have so many things. You, what I'm saying here will go 100, I don't know, miles, whatever, more than that. But imagine Abraham, he didn't have any of this. So how was he supposed to build a global ministry? Look in verse 19. It says, for I have known him in order that he may command his children and his household after him that they keep the way of the Lord to do righteousness and justice that the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has spoken of him. So how did he get his global ministry going? Through his, through his children. Because Abraham took the time to command his children and his household after him above about God, sorry, about God. And that's how he built, began to build a nation. So let's look at how you and I can build, have a global ministry. How can you and I build a global ministry? I think one of the ways is looking your, looking your children in the eye and telling them, looking your children in the eye and telling them that Hey, sorry, I'm using the names of my children. You use the names of yours. Jeremy and Nora, you are bound for so much more. You are going to be reaching nations. You are going to be reaching the city. You're going to be reaching people. 
out through the gifts God has put in you, through the abilities God has put in you, through the purposes God has for you, you will reach more. It doesn't just stop here. It doesn't just stop with you. It goes much beyond than you. Amen? So parents, take that time to speak this over your children eye to eye. Tell them that they are, they are ready for, they are to be ready for a global ministry because that's what God intended. And that is what he will still continue doing. The next is God's plan for the world starts with honor in the home. God's plan for the world starts with honor in the home. So if you look at Exodus chapter 20, it talks about the Ten Commandments. Yes? So if you have seen the Ten Commandments, the first four commandments are vertical. It has to do with your relationship with God. And the six after that are Horizontal, it has to do with your relationship with one another, okay? And have you noticed that um, the, first, the fifth commandment, which is the first commandment of uh, the commandments of relationships, it talks about honor your father and mother. So why, have, you, have any of you thought as to why did this come first and do not steal or do not commit adultery came, didn't come before that? So let me tell you, if you were to have a baby, let's say a two-year-old child, would he go steal first or have adultery or is his, is his life about honoring his parents? It's about honoring his parents. That's the first practical moral decision that a child is faced with. And I believe that's why it's put in that order, to be able to honor your father and mother. And it says that if you honor your father and mother, what happens? It goes well with you. So that's the way God ordered it. Honor dad and mom first. And that's how he has ordered it. Okay. I love to bring in application because I think that's what really tugs our hearts. Okay. So how do we bring about honor in our homes? One of the examples. Sometimes, you know, in our homes we may see our children dishonoring one of the parents. In some way or the other, you know, either through their word or through what they say or through their actions. What do you think is the responsibility of the other parent to get back that honor? Tell your children, hey, that's not how you treat mom. That's not how you treat dad. You need to honor them. And maybe even publicly ensure that, that, that the parent is honored. So if you do find children or you do find um, yourself as an adult child, not giving honor to your elderly parents. I think that's, that's a wake-up call for us. Does God want me to ensure that I honor my elderly parents, take their wisdom? Every Saturday, Sunday, we, we go to my parents' house and we stay the day with, with them. And there's something, some things that, you know, we push our children to do, to go and maybe give their Apacha and Amachi a kiss or go and say a hello to them or go and give them some... Some, something that is happening in their life. Why? Because they need to be honored because that is what God wants us to do. It's just not honoring your father and mother till they are up and able, but even when they aren't or even when they're on their deathbed or even when they are not able to walk, it calls out for honor. Another application for young people. I think this is a test of maturity. You could probably check to see how good you are at honoring your dad and mom. Who you can touch and see. Because if you can do that, then you will honor the heavenly father who you can't touch and see. So I would look, look at that as a test of maturity. You know, you have these tests, right? In chemistry, you have litmus tests, that test. Find out how mature am I to be honorable? Can I honor my parents? Because if I'm able to do that, then I know that I can honor my Heavenly Father. Church, are you with me? I hope. Okay, so as we move on, let's move on to the next one. God plans for the fam God's plan for the family is in the greatest commandment. God's plan for the family is in the greatest commandment. So where do you find the greatest commandment? Question time. Yeah, those of you are right are right, so you can speak loud. Where is it? In Deuteronomy chapter 6. Very good. Wonderful. Okay, so what does it say? It says, 
you shall love the lord your god with all your heart with all your soul and with all your strength let's wait there so what is the greatest purpose of our lives of my life is to have my relationship with god have my relationship with god straightened out and out of my relationship with god what should come let's look at verse 6 and these words which i command you today shall be in your heart you shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk to them when you sit in your house when you walk by the way when you lie down and when you rise up so after my relationship with god i have been given a very specific mission and that is to impress my children with the word of god talk to them about the word of god so first comes here then comes with my children and often i think what happens in in our churches is it first comes here then i go out i forget who's standing with me so i'm having a single ministry and in god's plan that doesn't work he wants his family he wants his generations to fill the earth okay how can we apply this first of all parents if you want to impress the word of god in your child if you want to talk to them one of the foundational things the way it can be done is through family worship and i know in a time like ours a lot of us struggle to just come together at the end of a day pray hold hands speak the word of god sing a couple of songs have uh you know have a worship time just pray for each other cry together we miss out on that but this is foundational to god's plan if you need to impress god's word into their heart it needs to be done through a family time through a family worship so let me encourage all of us so i'm i'm not saying that it happens in my home all of the time it doesn't and i'm as guilty of it as maybe a lot of you are but that's something that i've i've understood as the importance of kneeling down together as a family in prayer because there there is a blessing let's look at another application i think for us as parents the best gift that you can give your children is your own personal spiritual growth your own personal spiritual growth um so when i, I remember my father he uh, right from the time we were young he used to keep talking about god's faithfulness like i told you of the stories that he's told me he's told me about the faithfulness and goodness of god now when i became an adult that was my starting point but right now when i have children of my own i think they are at a better advantage because their starting point is much bigger because we've learned about using the word of god for healing for uh, for divine miracles for the supernatural that's their starting point do you can you just imagine where they would go up they would probably be in places where you and i have never reached where, where we've never seen maybe those kind of revelations have never been there that's where they will be going and that's that's the vision that we need to carry because when i take the time to impress God's word over my children talk to them when they're sleeping talk to them as we're going out talk to them about it in school whatever they're doing they're not it's just not a story it's it's a life example it's it's a uh, it it's the gospel that you are pushing ahead of time okay so let me encourage you as parents to be able to do that because i don't think there is a greater call or mission other than that our call and mission is in our home with our children more than it is in a city or a nation it will come it will it will be progressed as it goes let's move on to the next one the god's desire for us is to recount his mighty acts to the generations god's desire for us is to recount his mighty acts to the generations so i've taken two scriptures here but i'll i'm i'm not going to get into the verse but i'll just give you a background of what happens in in joshua and later in first samuel so when joshua is going to cross over to canaan with the israelites you'll remember the story yeah does a miracle happen there yes what does god do 
He makes the waters stand up and all of Israelites go in. And what does, what does God tell them to do? God says, get one person from every tribe, pick 12 stones and place it there. Were they playing Lagori? Okay, that's just to wake you up. What was it for? Those were placed as memorial stones. Memorial stones. What do memorial stones do? They are God's acts in history. And what do they do? They were a physical curiosity. So when the children used to see that, they'll say, hey, Dad, Mom, what are, why are those stones there? And the dad and mom would say, you know, when this happened, remember that the generation that passed by uh, in, through the Jordan were the newer generation. None of them were there at the Red Sea, except for Joshua and Caleb, right? So none of these children probably knew that. I don't know if the parents really did it. But God ensured that there was a memorial stone kept up there so that this, you know, children will look and say, oh, okay, wh wh what was this for? And they, it was a curiosity. So it talks about God's goodness. A memorial stone also is a reminder of your experience. And it is also a testimony of what God does, right? Now, when you look further on in... Uh, uh, in the Bible, it talks about in Samuel, that's in, um, sorry, I've lost myself. Okay, First Samuel 7, 12. And when, when the Israelites have fought against the Philistines, they have victory. God says to Samuel, he took a stone and named it Ebenezer. Yeah, and what does it mean? Thus far the Lord has helped us. So is there a need for us to place memorial stones? How are we going to do that practically in our day and age? Are we going to place stones? So let me tell you something that we did. Um, when, my, when my mother turned 70, we put up a little video for her, for her birthday blessing. Now my mother has an amazing testimony um, for herself. She was... She was three years, I think, when she lost both her parents in the World War. And uh, they were in this place called Isbonio. And I think my granddad was working there. And so, you know, the World War happened and uh, the parents lost their lives. My father, my mother has a younger brother who's two years older. So I can imagine they were probably three and one or four and two or something like that. And they were picked up by a family friend in Borneo bought all the way back to India, you know, loitered around in Bangalore many, for, for some years till the person who looked after them swindled all the money. And that, that's when at that point of time he tried to figure out where her roots, where my mother's roots were. They found out the roots and that's how she reached her grandmother maybe at the age of nine or ten. Now that's an amazing story, a testimony of God's I mean, I'm thinking if that wasn't there, I wouldn't be there or my children wouldn't be there, right? But that's a memorial stone. And we place that entire video, of course, in honor of my mother, but that's something that we have passed on to our children so that our children can look up and say, you know, if God could do that for my great-grandmother or my grandmother, you know, God will lead us through it all. So a memorial stone. So what can you do? to place different stones or memorials, some memorials about God's goodness in your life and show them out to your children. It could be through a blog, it could be through a book, it could be through stories, I don't know. There are so many ways that you can do it. But let me tell you, take the time, take the energy to do that for your children. Let's look on to the next one. God's plan of passing the faith is with a heart connection. God's plan of passing the faith is with a heart connection. If you look in Malachi chapter 4, verse 5 and 6, this is the last um, time that God speaks to his people before a 400 year of silence. Okay? And what does he say? He says this. He says, Behold, remember the law of my servant Moses, the decrees and laws I gave him at Horeb for Israel. I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the earth with a curse. So what's, doing, what's God doing here? 
God is giving a glimpse of his plan to bring salvation into the world. He's saying, you know how I want to bring salvation? I want to bring salvation by having the fathers turn their hearts to their children. So God said that at, in Malachi, 400 years before the New Testament, before Jesus came in. Okay? And the, how was the plan? The plan was, to, was through discipling. It was only through discipling where fathers turned their hearts to the children. Now, sadly to say, um, sometimes our fathers are on an AWOL. You know what an AWOL is in corporate terms? What's that? Absent without official leave. So sometimes our fathers are absent without official leave when it comes to spiritual leadership. I have silence in the house. So this is how the progress goes. As the man goes, the marriage goes. As the marriage goes, the family goes. As the family goes, the church goes. As the church goes, the nation and great commission goes. So where is our root? Yes, I, when I mean by men, I also mean women. <laughs> So we as parents, as fathers, need to take back the leadership that we've lost and come back home to family worship. So I know I'm speaking to dads, moms, but we need to be able to do that. Turn your hearts to your children. And that is through spiritual leadership. So let me give, show you something very interesting. So we spoke about the last words in the Old Testament. If you look at the first words in the New Testament, it starts with Gabriel going to Zechariah and prophesying about the birth of John. And you know what he says? Very interesting. Uh, read with me. It's in Luke chapter 1 verse 16. He says, He will also go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children. Is that familiar? Where did we read this? In Malachi. And the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. So what he left back in Malachi saying, hey, this is what I'm going to do, turn the hearts of the fathers to their children. He comes in the New Testament and tells that John is the one who's going to be the one who's preparing the way of the Lord, the way for the Lord, the Messiah. But how do you prepare the way for the Lord? By the fathers turning their hearts to the children. So is that something that God has, has really planned? So God saying, fathers, you got to do your job with your children if you want to throw the gospel out into the nation. And that's the call that he gives of us today. Fathers, turn your hearts to your children. So let's look at some application. Fathers, how do we turn our hearts to our children? Sometimes fathers turn their hearts away from their children just simply by having no time and no space to spend with their children. Just having no time and space. Or fathers turn away their hearts through their communication because it was always a litany of put-downs and discouragement. That's how you turn your heart away from your children. Or it could be that bitter spirit of disappointment that your child didn't do what you wanted them to do or they didn't follow the path that you want them to. Fathers, you've turned your heart away from your children. Can I, I, you know, can, I, I can't stress and emphasize this more. Fathers, your role in the family is like revival to the world. So when you take your place, when you ensure that you turn, you, you, um, you attract the hearts of your children to you. You know, the gospel will go forward. Children, I have something to tell you. How do you turn your hearts to your parents? How? By obeying your parents. As simple as that. If you are children to elderly parents, it is to honor them, obey them, take their wisdom, take their understanding, go, go take care of them if they're ill, take care of them. 
I mean, honor them. Give them positions in your family functions. That's how we turn the hearts of our fathers to our children and vice versa. I hope I'm speaking to all of us here today because this spoke to me in a hard way. All right, let's move on. God reiterates his plan today. So what God told Adam and Eve is still applicable today. Let me show you in Matthew chapter 28 verses 19 and 20. It says, Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Okay, if you look at that, uh, may I have the next slide? If you look at that little table there, it actually shows you that the, com the first commandment in Genesis 1 is a reiteration and expansion. I mean, the Great Commission is an expansion of the first commandment. Let's just look at that. So it says, in the first commandment, it says, be fruitful and multiply. What does it say in, great, in the Great Commission? Make disciples. Is it the same thing? Yes. Okay. First commandment, it says, fill the earth. And the Great Commission, it says, of all nations. First commandment, it says, subdue it. Take in every sphere that you have, the family, the entertainment, the world around, your business. Take it, subdue it. And what does the Great Commission say? Teach them to obey everything I have commanded you. So God's plan hasn't changed. What he said at the time of Adam, it continues today. That to, to be able to carry on the plan of God. And you cannot, like I said, I reiterate this again and again, we cannot make disciples outside if we have not made disciples inside. And that is how that moves in. Let's move on to the next scripture. God's order for discipleship and evangelization. What is God's order for disciple? How does he see it prog progressed? Let me show you that in Acts chapter 2, verses 28 to 29. It says, this is when Peter preaches to the early church and he's saying, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is to you, your children, and to all who are far off. So in God's progression, how does it go? Does it say you to the world? It says you to your children and to the world. It's you to your children, to the world. If we take out the middle piece, if we don't do our jobs and take out the middle piece, we cut out God's plan to fill the earth with his work and worship and wisdom. So it needs to follow that multi-generation. You, your children, and then the world. As I can conclude, I'm there, I'm ready, I'm done. As I conclude, you know, as we walk through the scripture, um, it makes more sense now why the family is in attack, doesn't it? So we have issues, husband and wife relating to each other, children and parents, brothers and sisters, parents and grandparents. We have issues there. Why? Because Satan knows if he attacks that middle piece, Gospel is not going to move forward as fast as you would want to. So the next time you fight with your wife or with your husband or with your children or with your grandparents, look them in the eye and say, this is not us. And patch up. Because the greatest attack is on the foundation. You hit the foundation, you've hit the building. And that's what Satan's looking at, to hit on your foundation of your family. Because by doing that, the gospel will not progress. The gospel will not reach the nations as you would like to. So in conclusion, again, I just have one verse to leave with you. That's in Psalm chapter 78, verses 4 and 8. I'm going to read this out. It says, we will not hide them from their descendants. We will tell the next generation the praiseworthy deeds of the Lord, his power and the wonders he has done. He decreed statutes for Jacob and established the law in Israel which he commanded our ancestors to teach their children. So the next generation would know them, even the children yet to be born. And they in turn would tell their children. So God desires a multi-generational vision for the family. So when you impact your children, 
you're not only impacting these kids who are here, you're impacting a children who are yet unborn. You're impacting a generation who you may never get to see. And that's what God wants you to do. So when we have this vision saying, God, you want me to ensure that my children are impressed with the word of God. You know, our actions, our thoughts, our understanding, we will strategize it in such a way that we will have the gospel of God for, go forward. And so let's be diligent in doing that. I really do want to cast this out to you. So parents, young people, uh, children, let's get back on track to what God really is looking for in us as a family. Because through us is where the nations will get to know the world. We trust that this message was a blessing to you. We would love to hear from you. You can email us at contact at apcwo.org. Also visit our website apcwo.org for additional resources. Thank you for listening and God bless you.